I'm April Lovett. And I'm Daryl Lovett. And this is Success in Black and White. The podcast. Where our mission is to bridge the gap between Between racial racial boundaries. boundaries. Hey, everybody. We are back again with another very special guest. April is going to read the bio and we'll jump right into this episode. Dr. Dorsey Spencer Jr. is a student affairs professional, educator, scholar, author, and entrepreneur. He resides with his wife and children in New York and is currently the Dean of Students at Colgate University. He oversees a robust portfolio and has direct responsibility for several key functional areas related to student engagement. He has an array of experiences within higher education in the United States and abroad. Dr. Spencer has a bachelor's degree in sport and recreation management from Temple University, a master's degree in higher education administration from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and a doctorate in higher education from Florida State University. Additionally, Dr. Spencer is the author of Worms Are a Yummy Snack, a children's picture book, and the owner of CS Fly LLC, an independent publishing company. For more information or to purchase books, visit www.csfly.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Success in Black and White. The podcast. We are back one more again. We are back one more again. We're back and we're not alone. We are not alone. We have the one and only... The incomparable Dorsey Spencer with us. Do- Dr. Dorsey Dr. Spencer. Dr. Dorsey Spencer. I was about Spencer. to say, get it right for the introduction <laughs> and then and then we'll fade off. So <laughs> we are we are excited um, to have him on the show with yeah. us, someone that we know very well. And um, he has a lot of expertise and a lot of knowledge to share with you. Um, and as you know, we talk to people with um, vast knowledge and who has a lot of uh, different things going on. So we are going to talk about um, his book he, because he's an author. So we're going to cover a lot of topics um, and give him a chance to, to kind of share with you um, what he's up to, what he's doing, and tell you a little bit about the book and whatever else we decide to talk about. Yep. So well, how do you want to start it off? Let's start off with Dorsey. We Everybody heard your bio. We know that you're a dean. We know that you're an author. We know you're an entrepreneur. We know you're just like a cool dude, obviously you're one of our (laughs) friends. So just start off and tell us like, how did you get to where you are today? Because you have some fascinating stories. Um, you've had some very interesting experiences and I think for our audience, it might just be really interesting to know, like how you got from where you grew up to being a Dean of students and being an author and all the other cool things that you do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for for having me on the show and this opportunity. I really appreciate it. So I guess it it goes all the way back to, you know, growing up. I I grew up in in New York. I was born in Queens. We lived in Harlem for a while and then we moved to Long Island. And um, I'm the son of a New York City police sergeant, retired New York City police police sergeant now and um, an administrator in the hospital. And they really, you know, grinded to make sure that I had as many opportunities as possible, right? So from the moment we, we lived in, in the projects in Harlem, we li- lived in what is called Grant Projects, which is off 125th Street and Amsterdam Avenue, so down the street from uh, Columbia, but real close to the Apollo and in, in the heart of Harlem. Um, and then we moved to Long Island to pursue greater opportunities, the suburbs, better school district. Uh, but they, you know, I remember my father working four or five jobs, right, just to make sure that we could maintain the lifestyle of being there, we, we never wanted for anything, right? Because they really made sure that we, we were taken care of. And, you know, I remember my mother commuting back and forth on a regular basis, leaving four or five o'clock in the morning to get to work and then coming back in, in the evening. Um, but they really ingrained a work ethic in, in, in us, I think, as, as, you know, growing up. So, you know, went from a very interesting dynamic of being in a predominantly Black uh, environment in Harlem, right? Because Harlem was not Harlem is not the, the gentrified Starbucks Harlem that you <laughs> see today. It, it was like <laughs> predominantly people of color, right? So I, I actually, you know, I, I usually joke about this, but I don't remember too many. Why I don't remember engaging with too many white people when we lived in Harlem, right? They, maybe in my preschool, but in my day to day, that was not my experience, right? The store owners and, and and everyone was generally a person of color, right? Even if they were, you know, Asian or Latinx or what have you, generally the people we interacted with were, were, were people of color. Only 
one per white person I really remember was my dad's uh, police partner, right? When, when he was, when we worked in, in Harlem. So it was a bit of a culture shock moving to Long Island, right? To engage in a totally different environment, to engage with totally different types of people. Um, I tended to be the only black person or definitely the only black male in my classes going, growing up. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge at times. And um, it, our, our, our community is a, quite a bit segregated, right? So the vast majority of people of color live in one side of town. And then, you know, there's like a highway that divides us and then you get to the rest of the, the, the town. So there's a lot of segregation in Long Island in general, but I, I've experienced that a little bit firsthand. And I remember growing up, one of the most vivid images of that segregation was as you rode your bike on the sidewalk to go home from school or wherever, as you got to the black section, which you went over overpass, that went over the highway, the sidewalk ended. Right. And for years, you had to like jump your bike off the curve into the street to kind of continue on. Only more recently did they put a sidewalk in, but that's more because they were building a new development, they had to put the sewage or the irrigation in. So they put a sidewalk in now. But growing up, we didn't we didn't have that. So you couldn't walk safely on the road or ride your bike safely on the road like others could. So that's kind of what I remember. But, you know, we, we play sports and, and all that. We did track and did karate and, and some other things growing up. And Ended up going to college, went to Temple University. I was dead set on leaving New York. My parents both went to school out of state, so I wanted to do something similar. Had an amazing experience at Temple University. Um, I, I actually chose it. It was between Temple or going to an HBCU, which my parents went to HBCU. Um, and many family members of mine went to HBCUs. And Temple, for me, it was... In, at the time and for many years was one of the most diverse institutions in the country, right? So as a lot of students it had that experience of, you know, I went to a PWI and I never had a professor that looked like me, right? Like that was very much not my experience at, at Temple, right? So I had black professors, I had black administrators. The Dean of Students when I was there was a black man, right? Um, the Vice President for Student Affairs was a, a, a black woman and she's still there, right? So I had this you know, community of people who look like me, so you can almost see like, oh man, I could be like that person, right? So I think started to turn my gears of how do, you know, do I want to go into higher education? Because originally I, I was a film major. I wanted to be a music video director, actually. Yeah, when I when I, I did video production in high school and everything as, as a second high school degree and transition to film. And with film, and, you know, this is probably the best reason for not doing film, but I remember being in a class and, you know, when you're in the film program, it slowly funnels out people, right? So you slowly shrink and shrink. And I remember walking into one class one day and I had been taking out like student loans and working and stuff to try and get me through school. And the professor, I remember, I just remember her saying, you should expect to be poor for the next 10 or so years, right? As a film, as a film major, because it takes time for you to build up your, your, your craft and your credibility. And I was like, I'm doing all this to be poor? Right, and in my mind, I'm like, nah, I, I need to reconsider my life, right? So I, I had to really kind of think about what I could transfer to and you know, not set myself back too much. So originally I, I was thinking maybe I'd become a teacher because right? I, I enjoyed that. And, you know, I was like, oh, well, I can teach and coach, you know, and that would be a great experience. In the education department, uh, they were like, you would have to start all over because we have a very specific format that you have to follow in order to go through our major. So I you know, kind of scrapped that. And I wound up in the School of Tourism and Hospitality, which there at Temple includes um, tourism, hospitality, but also sport and recreation. And, and being a former athlete, track runner, I ran, I think my first uh, year or two at Temple, um, but grew up as an athlete. I wanted to go into uh, uh, sports, uh, or my mindset was wanting to go into sports, particularly intercollegiate sports. Um, did that, had the opportunity uh, to serve as the first student run homecoming chair thinking that, hey, this is a great connection to sports, but you actually work more with the student affairs people, mm -hmm. right? And they slowly start to kind of drag, you know, pull me over to the student affairs side. Um, so by the time I graduated, I was part of SGA and, you know, did all that. Um, wasn't really sure I wanted to go into student affairs wholeheartedly yet, so I took a year off. I worked at various places and then decided to go back to grad school. I went to UMass Amherst and then uh, got my degree there, served as a graduate assistant for a Benson program. So I did a lot of the big concerts and comedy shows and worked with different cultural groups and did all these great events and programs. Um, graduated there, took a job in central Pennsylvania, worked there for a year, and then this at a, 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 a small private liberal arts institution and, and then had this amazing opportunity come about. So one of my mentors from uh, UMass Amherst 
you know, called me while I was at this other institution and, and, and kind of just said, hey, I'm about to take a job in, in Africa. I think I want you to come over and work with me. And at first I'm like, there's no way this man's taking a job in Africa, right? You, he's just engaging in this process. There's no way he's actually gonna take this job. So, you know, calls me a little bit later, says, no, actually I took the job. It's, let me give me some time to learn to lay the land, and, but I think I'm gonna need you to come over and, and do some things for me. So I said, okay, I'll humor him, all right. Um, so we, you, he, he was there for a while and the call came and he said, hey, um, we're looking for a director of student activities. Why don't you come over? You would basically be creating your student en engagement portfolio from scratch. The only thing they really have here is SGA. So I said, all right, I'll interview. But he said, I really want you to interview here so you can really get the full effect of what it's like to be here, right? So that you didn't do Zoom. So <laughs> they flew me over, right? <laughs> um, so, um, you know, first time in Africa, right? And I'm just like, in Nigeria. So I worked in Nigeria and, and, and it's just like that, you know, spiritual awakening moment of like, wow, I'm, I'm actually here. And, you know, this is awesome. Um, and, you know, I flew into Abuja and the, the, the institution, uh, the American University of Nigeria is in a very rural part of the country. So it's in um, the eastern part of the, the country, which is the border between Nigeria and Cameroon. Um, so you get there, and it's very rural, right? It's, it's a very rural um, place. And you get there, it's, it's just, it makes you feel just like so, you know, connected, right? Because Abuja can be a little urban, um, more Western looking, right? It has, you know, tall buildings and that stuff where in Yola, there's no, there's no such thing, right? Um, so went there and just at first was kind of just learning it, understanding it, and, you know, wind up getting a job and took the position and worked there for three years, right? And it, it was probably one of the most challenging but rewarding experiences I've ever had in my life, right? And, and, you know, I try to help people understand that it's just, you know, everything you know about higher education, about student affairs, about student development, it's kind of twisted a little bit, right? Because the, the typical structures and, and things that are in place in the U.S. are not necessarily there. So, you know, when you're planning a concert or any of those things, you're literally trying to figure out logistically how you can do this in a rural part of the country that may not have the same infrastructure that you were, you're typically used to. Um, in addition to that, we also were in the, the shadow of a, a terrorist group, right? So there was a terrorist group called Boko Haram that also operated within our region. So a lot of times we were on like curfew or high alert. So there are different times you had to deal with that. Um, so that was a, a, a you know, I, I even remember my mother, uh, God rest her soul, before I, I took the job, when I was, you know, thinking, well, I was going to take the job, she used to send me every so often these news articles of like bombings and stuff <laughs> taking place in the country. And I'm like, mom, I'm, I'm going to take the job. <laughs> like you can stop saying this. But I do know my family was very concerned, you know, worried about me while I was I was up there. And, and, you know, I had, um, during my time there, I got married and my wife um, got pregnant. We had our first child my last year there. And I decided to come back and um, actually had to do a Zoom interview before it was Zoom. So it was Skype all day for, 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 for a position at Florida State. Um, because, you know, to fly someone over is almost the cost of your whole search if you if you do it that way, uh, one plane ticket. So I, I eventually um, got the position at Florida State and kind of worked my way up from the union and then over to the vice president's office. And after some time there, uh, an opportunity at Colgate arose and, and, and I wound up being the dean of students where I oversee uh, a very much a student engagement portfolio. So it's a student engagement and um, identity support and development. So uh, multicultural, religious, uh, LGBTQ plus initiatives. Um, but I, I dabble in a little bit of everything in the division. So it, it's been a great experience and, and an awesome journey. I've met a lot of people on, on the way, had a many, many mentors and support systems along the way. So that's kind of how I ended up in, you know, where I am now, you know, going from Long Island to all the way back around the world and here to central New York. <laughs> wow. I want to know, wait, I, because I think I remember this. <laughs> Did they, did you have a car, like a driver while you were in Africa? So part of the, I guess part of my negotiation was um, some of it they give to you, some of it I had to negotiate, right? So they give you a place to stay, right? Because they want you to stay in a place. I mean, most people who are expatriates who come there, they don't know the area. They don't know where to find housing or anything to that effect. Um, so they provide you with housing. So I, I was uh, able to stay in this nice compound um that me and my my uh supervisor split 
it, right? So it was a nice compound that was there, but they also provide him with a car and a driver, right? So he uh, helps you get around and all those different things. Cause you, you know, it takes some time to learn the area, but their driving is a little bit different, <laughs> right? It might be more uh, 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 aggressive in some ways, right? So it, 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 it's, it's just, it can be a little jarring for those who are not as familiar with that type of driving. Um, once you, you do get a handle on it eventually, Right? Like eventually I could drive and I was fine. Um, but initially you're like, yeah, I'm good. I, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to mess with this, but yeah, car driver, uh, housing, right. Um, part of that deal was also, they pay for you to go home once a year. So they pay for your plane ticket to go home once a year, um, as an expatriate, it, you, which means you typically are uh, coming from a developed nation to a developing nation. Um, you, you also get tax breaks. So I think your first 75,000 or 72,000 or something to that effect is not taxable, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a benefit to you, you're not paying taxes on that, but that, you know, there, there are other things that you need to pay attention to when you do that, because if you make above that and all that, but there are perks to being an expatriate. I, I would encourage anyone who has the opportunity to work abroad to do it once, right? I did it for three years. Maybe not, you may not be able to do it for that long, but if you have that opportunity, I would definitely take advantage of it. I took away so, so much, so many like <laughs> things that I think are, are very important. And, um, I think very valuable principles for you to consider. Um, I mean, I think the first is most importantly is don't be afraid to take risk. Like, I feel like that's one of the, the biggest and most important things that, that I took away. Don't be afraid to take risk. Um, one of the second, and, and I think most valuable pieces or principles, if we're going to label them as that is, um, you talked about your mentors and that mentorship piece and how important that was, um, because, I mean, you would have never ended up there if, if someone that you, you know, d trusted didn't say, hey, I, got, I have this opportunity. And then furthermore, for somebody to just straight up just be like, hey, I'm going to need you to come over here. <laughs> like, you know, that that takes a lot. So so I think one, don't be afraid to take risk and the importance of mentorship are, are the like two things that I really took away. I took away a bunch, but those two kind of jumped out at me. Um, I, tell me this. So I know you talked about all of your mentors and I want to talk about the mentorship for a second. I know you talked about all your mentors and, and you know, the opportunities um, that have came from that. Like how, how did you find mentors? Like how did that work for you? Mm -hmm. Um and how did you know to like create those relationships and, and how to manage those type of relationships? Mm -hmm. So for me, I think it's something that my, my, my parents and particularly my father instilled in me as a, at a young age, right? So we were on a, uh, a track team where uh, my father kind of stepped in as the coach, you know, as a, other duties as a sign, like he was a, a dad coach, but then uh, he wound up being the head coach, right? But a lot of that was him serving as either a father figure or mentor to a lot of these students, I mean, you know, a lot of these kids in the community, right? Um, boys and girls, right? He was the kind of that, that figure. He would go and pick them up from their house and bring them to track practice and all that. So I think that is still that idea of you, you want to have that support system. And, and I was, you know, blessed with a lot of um, just people in my life, family members and, 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 you know, family friends that were very supportive. So for me, it was one of those things that I, I'm, I guess I would be describe myself as naturally ambitious, right? So I, I naturally latch on to people and I aspire to be like people, you know, people that, you know, have certain qualities. I try to learn those qualities from them, but I've always been a person that'll go out and say, you know, you know, can you teach me or build a relationship? That's one of my strengths, right? Building relationships and, um, and, and, and just throughout my life, there's been these key people, I, you know, at different points, I can almost point to who it was. And, and, and one of the things that, I think I'm attracted to people who I know are willing to provide opportunities because I think that's that's a core passion of mine. I think that's in many ways part of my purpose, right? I, I think that I like to help people, right? And, and, and growing up that may have, I guess, materialized in the form of, you know, being the idea of potentially being a first responder, right? Because my father was a first responder, right? So in my head, it was like, oh yeah, you want to be a person that helps people like that. But as I've got older, what I've learned is that that has actually changed into my purpose, at least the way I see it is, I really, really think that I'm here to help provide opportunities for people, 
right, to connect people to opportunities. I think higher education was just a vehicle for me to do that. But like, I am always inspired by, uh, you know, individuals like Robert Smith, for who, who was able to go to Morehouse College and say, you know what, we're just going to pay off everyone's debt, right? Mm -hmm. You know, individuals who actually can shift you know, whole family's trajectories by doing something, not necessarily small, but something that is, is just life altering, right? That they make that one experience. Like, you know, I think back to my dad, you know, being that person for those individuals and seeing a, a positive black man in that role, right? For many people may have changed their entire perspective of black men or that, you know, that, that type of relationship. But for me, mentor, I'm usually try to mentors who do that, right? So I think about people who have given me the opportunity to write, to publish, right? I was able to publish publish scholarly articles before I even had my PhD because I just went to someone and said, hey, you know, I really follow your work, you're great. If you ever, you know, I, I always try to approach it from a, a layer of humility, right? So I always say, if you ever have an opportunity for me to work with you or collaborate, you know, please let me know, right? And in some cases they are automatic, right? They're quick. They're like, actually, I'm writing this article, you could help me do this thing, right? Or, you know, I'll keep you in mind for this thing and I'll refer you, right? There have been times where I've met a person once or twice, right? And they still, from that one interaction, will refer me for things, right? Or, or say, hey, you need to talk to this guy. He's a good guy, right? So I also try to pay that forward for other people. So any opportunity that I can do that, either with, with our students, right? right, Or just other colleagues or just people in general, right? If I can connect people to people, um, that's something that I, I always really enjoy and it's something that really gives me energy. Uh, I swear if I was ever, you know, could work for one of those organizations that just gives out grants and money, right, to different people, I would do that. Like, that would be my home. <laughs> if I could be just a CEO of a company or, or an organization, like, you know, some of those uh, bigger nonprofits where they just provide opportunities for people in various right. capacities, I would do it. But I think mentorship is really just, you know, it's important for everyone, right, to have someone to lean on, to support you, to bounce ideas off of you, to check you, right, to check you when you, when you need to be checked. Um, I think you need all those types of people around you in your life, right, to to help guide you through your path. And not that you have to be exactly like them, but I think each mentor in your life is there for a reason, right? They're there to provide some kind of opportunity or some kind of life lesson or support, right? Um, and you don't necessarily always see eye to eye with them, right? You don't always necessarily uh, agree with them, but they're usually giving you some nuggets or you're learning traits, even if it's things that you don't wanna do, right? Like, you're like, I would never do that because that's just not who I am, but you're learning from that experience. I think that mentorship is important for all people, right? All kinds of people. I think mentors of various backgrounds is important for all kinds of people, right? To see, you know, my mentors range from, you know, white women to black men to, um, you know, people who have totally different backgrounds for me that I look up to, right? So I think it's, it's important to have a, a good solid team of mentors, but also mentors with different backgrounds and experiences so that they can help shape you and you can have a more, you um, I guess, holistic view of your own identity, your own experiences in the world as a whole. <laughs> that was good right there. I know. I, I, you have a follow up? Cause I know he said, he like gave a softball pitch to like where I want to go next, but I want to make I sure. I know. Yeah, no, he did. And the only thing I was gonna say go ahead. was I remember, I can, I can validate what Dorsey said, because I remember first meeting Dorsey and I think I went back to you and I'm like, I know him. Like I know him already, but I actually didn't like, that was the first time I had met you, but I was like, I feel like I know him. I know him. And I was convinced, <laughs> I had convinced myself that I already knew you because you're a relationship builder. So meeting with you, I was like, oh yeah, like we talked like we were best friends forever. <laughs> and <laughs> it was the first time we met. And I went back to Joe, I'm like, I know him. Like maybe we served on a NASCAR board together. So we're like, I don't know, but I know him. I know him, know him. And then I was like, oh, I've never met him before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yes, go with the softball. What's your softball? So, so here it is. <laughs> and when you were talking just now, like you sounded like, a pure at heart entrepreneur. I mean, I, as I was listening to you, I was like, man, he said, hey, like, he's a straight up entrepreneur. And then when you said, if you could, you know, be the CEO of just somebody who passed out grants, I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> like entrepreneur all day. Like, <laughs> so, so we know that you are an entrepreneur as well. We talked about that in your bio and, and you're doing some great things on, on that journey in your life. Uh, what sparked that? 
and, and kind of what was the motivator behind that? Um, and tell us about, you know, what you're doing as an entrepreneur and, and then we'll kind of see where that takes us and then, you know, possibly talk about, you know, this right here. Yep. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. So I guess it's a, it's a culmination of a lot of different things that happen at, around within, you know, the same, a few years of each other. Right. So I think um, my father, as he's got older, has become more entrepreneurial. Right. Um, especially after my mom passed away, he started to take on more um just more projects and different things that generated income, right? So houses, right? He would, you know, he rents out houses that he's acquired from um, his family and, you know, fix them up and all that. So that kind of was something that he did in the latter part of his life. Um, I've had a lot of friends and colleagues who have taken on entrepreneurial endeavors over the last few years. Um, many have also done uh, social entrepreneurship, right? They, they, they have companies or organizations with a cause and they, they really leaned into that. Some of them so much so they, they've left higher education, right, or their career to take that on because they believe so hard, wholeheartedly into it. Um, I, I have people I went to school with that have appeared on Shark Tank, right? So like just little things like that start to get your, you know, your, 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 your um, gears in motion as far as what do you want to do. I, I'm an avid Shark Tank watcher, right, even though I don't have that necessarily that, that niche thing yet, but, um, but I like all those kind of shows, right? The profit, all those things of like just people, you know, creating their own, right? With, with, with what they have in order to do that. I've also been on this, um, I guess, financial independence uh, kick, right? Where, you know, most millionaires have seven sources of income, right? They have seven ways that they get money. Um, you, know, the, you know, thinking about just your financial future Right. How do you have extra sources of income, but also how do you save up, you know, the the learning the idea that most millionaires are actually millionaires because they just saved up in their 401k. Right. Their retirement funds is the most common way that people become millionaires, which is not which, you know, that's not the message that society really tells you. Right. They, they tell you, you got to be this big business owner or you got to be the next Bill Gates and all this. But it's not, actually not how most millionaires in the United States are, are, are created. And many of them are th things you wouldn't expect, like engineers or teachers. Right. And it's mostly because of their retirement and good budgeting and all that. So I think the combination of those uh, entrepreneurial experiences or having seen those from people and then the financial the journey to financial independence, I think, came to a head with the pandemic. Right. With the pandemic, things started to not necessarily get easier, but they slowed down because you weren't going out running around with the kids and taking them to this thing and going to meet this friend and, you know, doing these events at night and going to, right, all that kind of slowed down. So I remember last year um, as one of my New Year's resolutions, I, you know, I told my wife, I said, you know, I think I want to write a children's book this year. And, and you know, I'm thinking she's going to be like, you have too much on your plate, right? You do too much. Right? <laughs> and her response was simple. She was like, so do it. And I was like, oh, wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> you challenging me? <laughs> right? So it was one of those type of things. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna do it. So literally as I was walking around and you know, at the time I was, I was you know, on campus with y'all and as I was doing different things, ideas would pop in my head for the book and I would just write them down on my phone, right? Like as I'm walking to get lunch, I'm like, oh yeah, I could, this is what they could be doing, right? Or this is what, you know, so I started to cash out the story and, you know, writing, writing has always been something that, especially a children's book has been something that was, I guess, something that I've been interested in ever since a young age. You know, I remember being at like a fifth grade graduation and they were just, you know, doing superlatives about each person. And one of the things they said about me is, oh, he's going to be this great writer, right? I mean, they like tied in my last name somehow, but it's, it's been something that's been ingrained in me. So when this opportunity came up, I'm like, okay, let me, let me see if I can write a book. So, you know, part of that journey and part of any entrepreneur's journey is a lot of research. Right. Like you, I actually never had to write a book. So I'm like, I don't even know what this is like. Like, do I just write it and someone comes pick me up? Like if I want to publish it on my own, like how does this work? But you have to do an extensive amount of research, right. To really make sure you understand what this process is like. Cause they're really, there are really two or three main ways that a person publishes, right. They go through a major publishing company, right. They either go through what they sometimes refer to as a vanity company. So it's a company you come to, and they put the book together for you and kind of put it out there, you pay them for that, or you self-publish, right? And at first I was like, oh, maybe, you know, I'll go with the major call, you know, thing and just, 
and go through that, put a good book together, and hopefully someone will pick me up. But that could take years, right? That could take years and years and years for you to get that going. Um, the vanity thing, you have to put a whole bunch of money up front, and there's no guarantee that your book is quality or it's going to sell, right? So you put all this money, it might be decent, but there's no guarantee it's going to go out. A lot of times you still have to do a lot of the work anyway. You're still doing a lot of the marketing and all that stuff. Um, and then, you know, self-publishing is just you have to do everything yourself, right? So, you know, in my mind, at first I was like, well, let me do the 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 um, the the main route. But then I was like, oh, that's going to take a little too long. I don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. Things might start to pick back up. So let me try my self-publishing. But that means I had to learn step by step every single part of the process of process of, of publishing a book. But that's good because I learned exactly what it takes to publish a book, right? I know each step now of what it takes to do it. I understand the, the pros and cons of doing certain things. I understand what it means to search for an illustrator, to find an editor, to find someone who can print your book, right? To find someone to format your book. Whereas if I was, you know, mainstream, I may not, I may get you know, snippets of that, right, in decision making, but I wouldn't actually walk through the process that way. If I did vanity, I might be, I'm consulted through the process, but I don't actually have to sit there and go through step by step with, you know, when you do it your own. So I actually am really, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely exhausting and it takes a lot of time and energy, but I'm actually very appreciative of the opportunity to learn all those things. So I guess as, as we're talking about entrepreneurship, I think it's important for whatever a person wants to go into that they really spend the time learning that is that that craft and going back to that mentorship if you could find someone who's done it before that makes your life a lot easier right so i i reached out to people who self-published right i had friends who have other friends who who self-published and i reached out to them and had phone calls with them um you know i joined facebook groups right and different groups that they have for people who are publishing right just so you are you're in an almost a knowledge community of people who've done it and can share knowledge. Oh no, don't do that. That's really expensive. Try this or did webinars, all these different things, right? So I, I would encourage any person who's going into business for themselves to really do the research. I think sometimes people will see little things, right? And and you know, you know, we all at one point everybody and their mother wanted to um, flip houses, right? And they <laughs> right, everybody wanted to flip houses. It's like, okay. But do you actually understand what it takes to flip a house? Do you understand the market? Do you understand like what, you know, different parts of a house, right? What works, what does it work, right? What are the current trends, right, of a house, right? Um, so I had to do all that research, learn the craft, learn what it means to publish. And after that, I'm like, I might as well start my own business, right? At, at the end of the day, rather than, um, you know, passing it along or whatever. So I started my publishing company, See Us Fly LLC. Um, and what we strive to do is promote uh, books where kids of color are at the forefront of the book, right? If you if you look at the research, there are more books about uh, animals than people of color collectively, right? So when you think about that, right, you will see, if you think about when you grew up, right, even the people watching this, this, this episode and yourselves, when you think about the books you read as a young child, right? Think about how many of them were centered around a person of color, where the protagonist was a person of color. Like, I can't really think of any, to be honest with you, any books where I grew up that were children's books, where I saw myself reflected in the book. Um, and we're in, we're in a far too diverse of a society for that to be the case, right? Where people, a kid can go through school, you know, all of elementary school and not really read a book about someone like them or see a book with someone like them. So, you know, with this particular book, I, I really wanted to focus on a, a black father and son, right? I wanted to show them in a positive light doing something. Uh, you know, I, I really wanted the book to highlight, you know, just black people being, right? Like back, black people just being who they are and engaging. I remember growing up and going fishing and crabbing with my father, right? So I wanted that kind of kind of situation, but I also wanted a, a story where there were life lessons that came about from that experience right but I wanted them to or to to come about organically right so I didn't want it to be like oh you're beating them over the head with this type of life lesson it's like no it actually makes sense with the story right that this is what I'm trying to talk to you about you know patience emotional management anger management right learning a new skill right so character development is usually what they refer to it in, in, in the education system but it's I wanted something that anybody could enjoy but we centered a black family, right? Like that was who you met. That's who you taught. We knew met the, the, the wife and the daughter later on in the book. Um, but you saw them doing something that was just everyday stuff, right? Going fishing and, and, and all the lessons that came along with that. Uh, and I hope to write more books like that, right? Where we, we you get life lessons within the context 
of some just activity that's just joyful, right? That people just enjoy doing, um, but it's with a protagonist of color. I um, also hope to potentially do books with um, the autistic community. A lot of times they have books that don't really reflect them, right? So that would be another opportunity to do in, in, in the future. But it really started that idea of just being more entrepreneurial, right? Because you, you, when you're an author, you're more like an authorpreneur, right? You're automatically that way because once you publish, I, I'll never forget, um, you know, the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you ever have the opportunity to read that book as an entrepreneur, if you haven't, I would encourage you to read it. Um, it, it. It's a very good book to teach you about just the way entrepreneurs and people who are wealthy think in general. Um, and one of the things that he says in that book in particular is there was a woman who was interviewing him and she was, you would, she kind of had an attitude, right? As she was interviewing him, he couldn't really figure out what the attitude was about. And, you know, at the end of it, he kind of was like, you know, do you have a problem with me? And she was like, I'm a way better writer than you, but you sell millions of these books. And he was kind of taken aback by that, right? He, he was like, didn't expect her to say that. And one of the things he, he says to her, he takes the book and he says, you know, what does this say right here? And he's pointing to the, the cover of the book. And it basically says best selling author. He said, it says best selling, not best written, right? So mm-hmm. to give her a lesson of like, you have to learn how to sell this stuff, right? That's how you become a best selling author, which I, that's something that I think if, you, if you're if you interested in selling books or publishing right, or being an author, part of your role is a salesman and marketer, right? Like that's something that I don't think people a lot of times consider. Like you have to learn how to market, right? In, in this day and age, like using social media and websites and all those different things and ways to get your, your, your um, your book out and cold calling. And, you know, I, I remember reaching out to my son's school district and saying, hey, I wrote this new book. Would you be interested in me reading it for, for the class and donating a couple of books and then it being picked up by the bookstore in, in, in town and people buying a book that way, right? So I think there's a lot of things that people just need to understand about business in general. Uh, it's definitely challenging regardless of what industry that you're in, but I think knowing your craft, learning your craft is, is very important. Um, but I think it's something that anyone can do. They just have to take the time and energy to really focus on it, right? I, I think anyone can be an entrepreneur. And I, I, I also think that people underestimate the ability to be an entrepreneur and still keep your day job, right? I think there's, a, there's, there's too many people who are like, oh, I have to shift to that or I need to give up my whole life, right, to do that. And if you ever listen to, you know, one of my favorite sharks, Damien, uh, Damien John, right, he talks about him working at Red Lobster until he got to a point where he could quit his job with FUBU, right? He, he slowly reduced his time, right, as he got more successful, but he kept the job at Red Lobster, which he actually enjoyed doing, but, and, but also built his brand, right, and still built his company. So you can do both, right? You can have a fully functional career and, you know, have a house, you know, sell houses, right? Or have a, you know, publish books or what have you. So you have multiple sources of income. So in the event that, you know, something happens with your day job, you still have this other source of income and then you can transition or pivot as necessary. But I think that's, I guess what I would talk about with with the um, experience of being an entrepreneur in the book. I, I think that, you know, I would encourage the book for anyone who has a child in elementary school, right, who just wants to have that conversation of, you know, what does it mean when you, when you get angry, right? Well, how do you express yourself when you get angry? You know, are you patient? What does it mean to be patient, right? You know, what are some of the challenges you go through as you as you learn a new skill set, whether it's an instrument, a sport, right, a new craft? Like the, the book talks about all those things in a subtle way, but it also opens up the door for a conversation with children or, or, you know, kids in the class about those kind of topics so that they can in, embrace it. And, and I really, really like the idea that the, uh, the emotional management kind of emerged as it, because I think, especially for young boys and, and, and men, that's not really a topic we really get into with them, right? Of expressing yourself and like, it's okay to be mad, but it's not okay for you to tear stuff up, right? Like, right? Like, like little conversations like that. I don't know if we do a good job in society of really of really starting to to help boys process those emotions and educate them on those emotions and normalizing those emotions. Like there's a picture in the book that where the two boys, are, the, the, the father and son are hugging, they're embracing each other. And you don't see a lot of images of that in, 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 in our uh, children's literature, right? So I, I think little, yes, right? That, that, that picture in particular, you don't see a lot of that in our, in our society today, especially with black characters. So I think little things like that, I really want to make sure um, 
that that people got from it. Also, the, the book was actually a family affair, right? Like it was something that I did too with my family as a collective. You know, my wife helped me out substantially from editing and, and, and rereading the book and, you know, making little tweaks. My son, Chase, you know, who the book is, the namesake of the character in the book is him. And and he really let me know, like, dad, that looks weird, right? Like, that, like from, from his angle, because the book is written for people at his age group. So he was kind of my beta tester with that of, hey, what about this? What do you think about this? Read this to me. Do you understand this word? Right? Like, so that he could, you know, but it's so much so that I made him an editor in the book, right? He's listed as one of the editors because of that. Um, but even with my daughter, you know, she sees the book. And if you turn to the page where the, the young girl is, she will say, that's me. Like she was still even like right now. So it's, oh, that's me, right? Like not even knowing much, she can't read the book or anything, but she knows that she's a character in the book, which I think goes a long way and all that. So there's, there's just a lot that happened with the process of becoming an entrepreneur. Um, but the original calling was just like, I can do this. Other people are doing this. This is, I want to leave an impact on the world, but in my entrepreneurial endeavors, but you have the time right now. So take advantage of it. So listen, y'all, he just gave y'all game. <laughs> so like, much knowledge. I'm talking about he just dropped knowledge on y'all yes. so much. And it's so many things I took away. And I'm going to jump too. to the end of what you're talking about. And what um, I, I really think is, is a great thing is that um, one representation, obviously, that matters. And, and that's what you're doing um, by writing these books. To how it's a family affair. I mean, I love that. I think that's so valuable and that's something that will live on. And then third, that generational piece, like including your son as an editor in there, like mm -hmm. as he grows older, like when you're talking about generational wealth and generational knowledge, like that's how you're incorporating it. When you usually say things like that, people automatically assume like you're talking about like a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, but to have, you know, authorship and editing mm -hmm. to your name in a book, mm -hmm. um, I think that that's kind of showing them the way and showing them the possibilities. And, and that's so important. So everybody who just listened, like if you're an entrepreneur, if you're thinking about being an author, like he just gave y'all game. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even entrepreneurship in general, like you talked about having to do your research I also think, I mean, I think that if you're an entrepreneur, this matters probably 10 times over just being a traditional in the workforce, but for anybody, the love of learning, and you talked about that. And I think it's so, so important, you know, doing the research, the love of learning, and I just, oh my gosh, you dropped so much knowledge right there. And for anybody starting out, like this is, you have to be able to do this stuff. And if you want to be an author, you have to be able to do this stuff. Like you have to be able to figure out what you need to do next, the avenue you want to go. And if you are somebody who wants to be an author and you are a person of color, are you, are you, is it for primarily somebody who is black? Is it somebody who is a, any ethnic, racial heritage, who are you catering to with your company specifically? Yeah. I what like type that. of authors are you looking for? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's just one of those things of, you know, for me, any kind of author works, right? It, it's all, it, it's, I'm open to anyone, right? Um, I, I, I just think that we want to highlight the experience of people of color, right? That, that, that's, that's just something that's lacking. So I think anyone can write a book right, like that, right? Like you two could be author of one of my books and give a certain perspective of what that's like, right? You know, one of my, um, you know, one of my, I guess I, I would refer, refer to her as a, a mentor. Um, she published a book recently on what it's like to be a white woman raising a black child, Right to some of the challenges of what that's what that's like of what you know what I guess some of the cultural differences and the norms and you know they just trying to relate to that child and all those different things but that centers right that's centered around a, a, a person of color's experience right the idea of you know how do I raise this person to be a good person even though we have this difference. Um, but I also want to be conscious of this difference, right? Because they will experience the world differently than I will experience the world. Um, but I think that's the key part. So I'm open to anyone who's interested in writing stories that uplift, 
you know, people of color to uplift the experiences of, of people of color. Um, so, you know, if there are people who are interested, they can definitely reach out to me. We can have those conversations. I'm also, you know, able to help and consult if they would rather, you know, kind of have someone that mentors them through the process. I can also uh, do that as part of, of the publishing company. Um, but anyone, I, I welcome all people and we can always have a conversation about it. I love it. And we'll drop your company info, your business info in our show notes for people um, and on social media. So you can easily find Dorsey. Yeah. And I'll say it one time for the audio listeners, seeusfly.com. 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 Yeah. Man, but I feel, you know what? I feel like this was like a, 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 what do you call it? I was going to say a workshop. A workshop. (laughs) Like, I feel like this was like a, a, uh, what do you call it when you get a bunch of people together and uh, you all talk? Oh, I can't think of the name. The name just slipped my mind. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Oh, like a uh, oh. group? <laughs> yeah, like a group. Like a group. You get a bunch of people together in a group and they just kind of like <laughs> come up with goals and do things. I can't think. The name just slipped my mind. Anyways, I, I feel like he um, did y'all like. A, I know a solid and gave y'all some insight that a lot of people charge you for. Yeah. I appreciate you for delivering that on, on hey, our podcast. Cool. <laughs> I do too. I, I appreciate you delivering that on our podcast. I mean, we have so many more things we could talk to you about, but I really think it's important. And with something that you, something else that you said that I do want to reiterate because I think that people they think that oh, I want to be an entrepreneur and. I need to figure out a pathway to quit my job. And I'm going to tell you all, because I could tell you, because Dorsey is a good friend of ours. This is probably like the 11, 11 billionth time that Dorsey has talked to me about rich dad, poor dad. But I'm grateful for that because I think it matters. Like the strategies that you have to plan to get to your path, your career path, I don't think that it's linear. And in the United States, we treat it like it's linear, like, oh, you want to be an entrepreneur, but you also have a full-time job. No, you can't do that. Like we get pushed back all the time just for doing a podcast. They're like, oh, but you have a full-time job too. (laughs) Like, okay, I'm sorry. We can still do both. It's fine. And I love that you said that because I think people are so dead set on like, oh no, you can't do both things. That's ridiculous. Well, guess what? Sometimes it actually enriches the experience. It either enriches the experience of the other positions or roles that you hold, or those positions enrich your entrepreneurial experience or both, you know? And so I love that you said that you dropped so much knowledge tonight. Yeah. Free. Free knowledge. This hey, is crazy. Hey, we might, I would have paid for this. I was about to say, we might have to switch it up. We might have to put this on the little side list where you yeah. just pay to the money. We'll give you your cut. We'll give you your cut. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> no, nah, this is mastermind. 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 That's, what, you're That's what I was okay. thinking. That's what I was trying to say. Um, <laughs> like a group. Yeah. No. Nah, so, so worms are a yummy snack. That's the name of the book. We kept referring to it. And I know for the viewers, um, I was holding it up. So you had a chance to see it before the audio listeners. Worms are a yummy snack. Um, it is a great book and we read it um, to our kids and they enjoy it. Um, obviously, the name is, is very catchy. That gets our daughter all the time. She was like, oh, <laughs> why don't you eat a worm? <laughs> But the principles and concepts that are in here that you mentioned yeah. about patience, anger, joy, dealing with your emotions, um, I think is all relevant um, and, and it can help um, kids understand at their level um, how to handle those. And I really like that you said, and I, and I held up the picture about the father and the son hugging and how the, you know, the black father and the son are portrayed in this book, um, because typically um, either the black father is not there when you're talking about the portrayal of of black families or black youth. The black father is not there, or those emotional, um, you know, declarations are not there, um, or it's either like about sports or it's about yep. music. Um, and, and I really appreciate that yours was about going fishing and just hanging out those everyday. Um, life yeah. um, things that you and at the end, you know, I'm gonna mess with you a little bit. You cook fish, man. 
<laughs> no, I actually don't. I'm actually not a I'm actually not a big fish person in general, which was kind of awkward growing up, right? Because I would like catch them and crabbing, and we would go crabbing more than we went fishing. And I'm actually allergic to shellfish, but oh, but yeah. we would go. But like the whole family, like a like an extended family, would go crabbing. And I would have to be like, everyone would be eating all this crab and seafood. And I had to go get like Chinese food. <laughs> like, I was like, the, and, you know, my family, they, they love seafood. Like, even my dad loves seafood, but he's allergic to shellfish as well. And like, I'm the one who with the red lobster had to get like the chicken, right? Like that, that I just didn't really eat seafood like that. I, I'm, I've, you know, gotten better as I've gotten older, but it's just never been my thing. Um, but I actually enjoy fishing and crabbing and, and those type of activities. It's just like, I, it's just not something that I would eat or cook. I mean, nowadays I'll definitely eat a salmon, you know, some salmon and stuff like that. But no, not on a, on a typical be, uh, level. <laughs> Even here when we go fishing with the boy, uh, my son, and there's a, one of his friends, we take them fishing sometimes. It's just catch and release, right? So we just catch them and, and throw them back. So we don't, we don't worry about eating them. <laughs> yeah. And I was just messing with you because in the book, I know you was, you was, cook, you was cooking up the fish in the book. <laughs> no, I was just messing with you about that. <laughs> uh, all right, this has been good. This has been really good. I mean, good. you've given so much insight. Um, you shared your story, which I think will help a lot of people. We talked about a, a lot of different things, career trajectory. We talked about mentorship. We talked about entrepreneurship. We talked about um, how to become an author. Um, I feel like there are so many things that people will take away from this. We appreciate your time. We appreciate having you on. Yeah. Um, you got anything else? I mean, with Dorsey, I have so many things, but we can bring <laughs> for, him back. For the sake of this conversation. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, until the next time, we are out. Bye. Peace. Thank you.